Well, it was out of the blue to me. Um, I was thinking there has to be some mistake. Some girl has made something up. I got in my car and I started up there. And uh, he'd been picked up by the police and my sheriff. I'm still thinking it's a mistake. There's, you know, we'll get this cleared up and we'll be past it. One of the coaches from the camp called me. It was a complete shock. It was disorienting. It's not the first time I'd gotten a call from school that there was a problem, but this was far above and beyond anything we'd ever heard before. They weren't real clear with me right at first, but I had enough of a picture that this was, I could tell they were very upset and shocked. And so that upset and shocked me. And really the first thing I did was I called my son's pediatrician and I said, we need help. And, and I made an appointment, I had an appointment made to go talk to somebody. But he then got arrested and I didn't get to exercise that option for months. Like sexual abuse, that's not me, I didn't, you know, do that. It's, you know, she's making a bunch of this stuff up and I said that for a long, really long period. I mean, said it to my lawyer, said it to the court. I had to um, plead guilty to everything. And then I was put on deferred entry of judgment, which allowed me, uh, which is probation for felony charges. Um, and I was allowed to, you know, leave and go home and do the therapy that they assigned me. You know, I really struggled because there was a part of me that thought something's really, really wrong here. And so I'm thinking, I'm thinking really terrible things about my son. I mean, if these things are true about my son, those aren't nice things to think. And here I'm his mom and I'm not believing him. And I struggled with that. I struggled with not believing what he's telling me. And over time, it was really kind of astonishing how many other people wanted to, not mitigate, to kind of, to kind of, Yes, minimize what was going on. I had an attorney who told me, I think Ty's being honest with me. Um, we used a private investigator who said, oh, I investigate cases like this all the time. You know, girls are making things up. I had a former teacher of his, a former Boy Scout leader of his, call me up and she says, oh, my behavior is a teenage girl. I know about teenage girls. And, and I just, your son's wonderful. He can't have done the things people are saying. And over time I thought to myself, man, who am I, you know, that I'm not listening to him and believing him more? Um, we did start that therapy, and yeah, we thought, yay, you know, this, this is what we've been waiting for. But again, it wasn't really our choice to go out and look for it, this therapy. This was a therapist who was recommended to us through the courts. And yeah, it was Ty going in once a week and a therapist expecting him to be honest. And it just was, and he, him coming home and living with us the rest of the week the way he'd been living, and it wasn't enough. It wasn't what it took to get everything out there and in the open. I continued sexual behaviors, uh, continued looking at pornography, um, and you know I relapsed into drug and alcohol. I was in, you know, I was really good at um, manipulating people. Um, you know, I get things, but I'm also really good at lying to myself. At that point, I wasn't trying to, you know, check in with reality at all. Um, you know, I was good where I was at, and I was, you know, feeling good. Uh, I was doing stuff that I wanted. After he was arrested the first time and came home, there was some effort. There were efforts. But they'd come and go, and I don't know how I necessarily always knew, but I knew it wasn't an open, honest relationship. And then, again on, was it July or June? It was June. June. Um, in June, I went, had another court day, but it, uh, and I was arrested uh, again. The second time was, uh, I was sexually abused, I sexually abused um, a girl in school, in a classroom. And we got a call from the dean, you know, you need to come. There's been an incident. Well, I kind of felt like the world came to an end, actually. It just, there was a part of us, me that knew I had to, you know, had to deal, had to cope, had to be, go into action um, at the same time. And it's probably good that I had to do things 
right away because it felt like everything was falling apart. And some part of me wasn't surprised. I still thought, you know, it was a mistake. I guess I kind of went blank. I couldn't believe it was happening again. I guess, you know, I was still trying to minimize it myself. Trying to say that things were being blown out of proportion. That the girl had her own problems and she was taking it out on Ty. I didn't really believe that he had physically forced her to do anything or, you know, tried to make her do anything. I thought that it was still a mistake, we, but we just had to get through it. I don't think it was really until we started getting the disclosures from Oxbow that I started to believe that things had gone that far wrong. Before I didn't ever think anything was wrong. I didn't, you know, I didn't look, uh, I was objectifying people. I didn't, you know, ever see as, you know, what I was doing was wrong. Um, and, you know, I minimized things. I made them, you know, less than they were. I never thought I was going to be arrested for something like that. I thought I'd be, you know, arrested in the middle of the night because I snuck out and was doing drugs. At that point, I didn't, you know, specifically know that they thought it was a mistake, but it seemed like the best. You know, I knew that there's definitely situations where, you know, girls made stuff up or had lied, and it was the best <laughs> course to take when I was trying to get out of it. Um, and the second time, I was like, yeah, I did this, but that isn't true, and that isn't true. Uh, the things that I knew were wrong, like drugs and alcohol, I knew that wasn't you know, the, the right thing to be doing. I wasn't like seeking it out, but I wasn't opposed to it. Um, but the things that I didn't see as wrong, you know, uh, going out and having sex, um, you know, victimizing people, um, grooming people, I didn't see that as wrong or, you know, pornography, I didn't see really uh, wrong. And so it was, you know, why should, it, it, there was no, th nothing keeping me from, you know, mentally keeping me from wanting to do that. I know in hindsight, particularly that that period, that year in between, um, I really felt like I was trying to hold, I felt like our whole family was trying to hold the lid down on the boiling pot. I don't think I saw, I saw that more clearly in hindsight, but I know I was always worried because I wasn't seeing any change. I was in uh, the juvenile detention center there for a month, uh, and during that time is when my mom um, spent a lot of her time uh, researching uh, and searching on the internet for some place for uh, me to go. I think I used a search engine and started to, you know, therapy um, for sexual behavior, therapy for teen, you know, looking for teen therapy. There's a lot of teen therapy out there and it, it took some sifting and trying different word combinations and looking through the different programs to find ones that weren't about drugs and alcohol, um, and that were ready to talk about sexual behavior, and not only that they would deal with it, but were tell you know what I was beginning to see was this is something that really can be treated, and there really is hope and possibilities. The courts were looking at a potentially some sort of youth home situation, but it wouldn't have had therapy specific to sexual behavior. One of the big thing, the frustrating things was not seeing Ty get help and not, it's very hard to find and convince in the legal system that there is realistic therapy and there is realistic rehabilitation. And I have to say we even that first day coming to Oxbow, it was hard to imagine and hard to envision. The alternative was so dire, I couldn't, I had to, you know, I was grasping at straws, so to speak. Um, you know, having our son put away, having him have to register as a sex offender for the rest of his life, anything, I'd have done anything to avoid that. I, you know, in fantasy, I considered breaking him out of jail and going to Mexico. You know, I, 
I just couldn't envision that as a possibility in his life. You know, in talking with Ty's attorney, I would begin to tell I would began to tell her that you know there there is treatment for this, there is therapy. I want to get help for Ty. The point is to get help and to turn this around. Not and you know, it's not just about helping my son. How can we make it a safer society and a better world? You know, I'm like telling her there's a different option here. And um, she definitely asked for the court to assign a psychologist to do an evaluation. And she began to help us make this proposal to the district attorney, to the probation department, and to the judge to say, to let them know that as parents, we were willing to make this investment and that we thought this was an option. And would they let us try treatment rather than punitive measures? I think we told the psychologist what we th thought looked like the best. And we, um, I did have a really, my best feeling was about Oxbow. You did meet with the psychologist yeah. and uh, Dan and I met with her and she did her own research and she recommended Oxbow and the judge took that recommendation. When you dropped him off 16 months ago, how are you feeling as you drove away from here? Um, devastated just kind of empty. It was our 20th wedding anniversary. <clears throat> Couldn't believe I was actually walking out the door and leaving him here. I remember saying to your dad as I went, I'm like, am I really doing this? Are we really doing this? And I'm sure you weren't very thrilled to say, to support me in that and say, yes, you really are, dear. Here we go. And um, we did go spend some time with each other and didn't go straight home. I don't think we could have just jumped right back into life somehow. I never thought it was the wrong decision. I thought it was the only decision. You know, and, uh, and yeah, we've had over a year together without a Teenager. kid in the house. <laughs> and uh, we've had time to reconnect a little bit learn to talk to each other. The therapy has opened my eyes to some of my problems. Not that I'm all better yet or anything, but I, I'm at least aware of uh, some of the things that I should be doing differently. I've, I've always been kind of a everything's going to turn out all right guy. And I found myself in a situation where everything might not turn out all right. <clears throat> and I had to re-examine the way I looked at things and the way I looked at the people I love. And, uh, and open up a lot more than I used to. Well, I think we've gotten closer. As soon as I you know, got to Oxford, I knew that you know, the crap had hit the fan, and like the first session I had with Tiffany, I, you know, explained what it, or I told my perspective what had happened with, you know, the two uh, girls that I got legal charges for, and, you know, it was really minimized, um, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't all there. Like I said, you know, up until I got to uh, Oxbow, I wasn't being honest, uh, right now I can't think of like a single relationship uh, or sexual interaction that I have that hasn't been inappropriate or unconsensual. So there's a lot of relationships like that where they, you know, it wasn't like I, you know, grab them and, um, you know, drag them to a bathroom, but it was still me convincing them to do that um, that made it really not okay. It never would have gotten to that point if I hadn't brought it up or pushed it. My behaviors come with, uh, you know, with consequences and there's accountability. And luckily for me, my accountability came through change. That this place, you know, will, will help with so much more than just, you know, sexual behavior problems. It, you know, teaches a boy to be a man. It, um, you know, it, it changes you in more aspects than, you know, that one that you're having problems with. And so as a whole, I think it's made me a tremendously better person. Sometimes it went slower than I thought it should go. I wished it would go faster. So that part of it 
was probably my only frustration. But no, I never doubted that he needed to be here. Where else? I mean, yeah, he, he needed to be here. I know I um, spoke to a family on the phone recently who's looking at treatment for their son. And oh, I've talked to other families. And some families, I think, really struggle with the, oh, do we, should we really be putting him in residential therapy? And I, this couple I spoke to the other day, I was kind of broaching that subject with them. And they're, they're like, no, it's not working at home. We're, we've become his jailer. This, something has to be really different. And I'm like, yep, that's where we were. It just didn't work at home at all anymore. It just couldn't be. Do you think people, parents especially, have a hard time saying the words, my son has a sexual behavioral problem? Absolutely. Um, I don't think anybody wants to admit that. Certainly I haven't told a lot of people, there have been a few. I think we sort of created a small circle right away of people who sort of needed to know. And by and large, uh, people have been very supportive and empathetic. Um, and thank goodness for those people that you can, you don't have to be as guarded with and you can be a little more open and honest with. You know, people don't want to believe the worst in someone, generally, or a lot of people don't. I didn't. Um, yes, it took some coming to. Each time that he reread the list of the offenses that he knows about or the things that he's done that is wrong, and that list has, has grown and become more detailed as he's gained a better understanding. Each time we hear that, it's... It's sobering, it's sobering, and it, it reminds us that as we go home and as much as everything looks really great and terrific right now, there has been some really, really sad, unfortunate things have happened. And there's a real reminder that, you know, here's a place to not go again. There is really hope that this is something you can change and it's about making like, um, these boys whole again. And I've seen it, I've now seen it happen. I know that that was my, my hope, my tremendous hope when I left him here that day. Um, I remember being really struck when we came into the um, room for the first time and uh, they had that first group and some of the boys were asked to stand and give their mission statements that each boy develops here. And we, I was so impressed by those mission statements. And I knew just in those few minutes that these boys were doing work that many people never do in their lifetime um, to get to know themselves and to really change themselves. And like I say, I spent the year between the two arrests with my son and I kept hanging on and I kept worrying because I knew the direction we were going wasn't good and it wasn't changing. And since we've been here, I've really seen a complete and total change. My son's behavior before wasn't acceptable. You know, it's not okay. I'm certainly not saying that that kind of behavior was okay and that I'm defending it. Um, but I'm saying the person was, is defendable. And um, the change that you hope for is, is real and it's possible. And we got it here. I'm confident of that.